Hello, but my name is Mike, and I'm a friend of uh, Wendy McIntosh. Hi, mate. Thank you. Well, welcome. Okay. Wendy, would you like to start with our agenda? Or, uh, excuse me, our speaker? Our speaker, yes. And I would actually love to just... Um, Joanne, I'm so happy you're here again. You came briefly. Joanne came and introduced us to a lady who was a good link for us for our National Day of Prayer. So she just popped in. It was so lovely. So then we thought we would invite her. But I want to just read this bio because it's not too long, but it's just so jam-packed and wonderful. So, Joanne Yukimura was mayor of Kauai from 1988 to 1994. And she served in the county council for a total of 22 years. She graduated from Hawaii High School, Stanford University, and got her law degree at the Washington Law School. Um, Joanne is the first Japanese-American woman mayor in the United States. Many thanks to congratulate you, Joanne. She's always on the forefront of innovation, Council member Yukimura started the Kauai bus. I didn't, I love the Kauai bus, thank you. She was one of the founders of KIUC. She authored and secured a passage of one of the strongest shoreline setback laws in the count, country, as well as the first ordinance for controlling vacation rentals. These are so topical concerns for us. She started the first self-help housing project, the first recycling and composting program, the first sunshine market, and the first bike path. But just thank you, thank you, thank you. She helped to protect over 250 acres of coastal open space. As a citizen activist prior to running for office, she led the effort in 1976 to stop high rises on Kauai. Again, thank you. Ms. Yukimura, our beloved Joanne, has been a watchdog and voice for the people, especially for low and moderate income families who are often forgotten. She has always been a strong advocate for the protection of the environment, good planning, and growth management. Her greatest love has been the children and youth on Kauai, and she's mentored several young women, served many years on the advisory committee advisory board for the Boys and Girls Club, and was a founding member of Keiki to Career. She presently, is that still now on the Resilience Project? Are you still? Yes. yes. And, and public service has been her lifelong passion. Joanne's husband, John Weirha Weirheim, is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Is an author, filmmaker, and a hydroelectric consultant. They have two adult daughters, and a beloved four-year-old granddaughter. And I met her, you brought her to the uh, Martin Luther King Day. That's right. <laughs> that was nice. And she has an extended ohana. And I think, can we be part of your extended ohana? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So All right, well, thank you, Wendy. That was kind of a long introduction. Uh, yeah, well, but, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so good to be with all of you here. I, you know, to be in a loving conversation with fellow seekers is actually a rare opportunity in COVID times and in non-COVID times. So thank you for this. Um, so Stephen Covey is one of my uh, teachers. Huh? Oh, and um, he, you may know of him, he wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he said that, I think he quoted Tehar Du Chardin in saying that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. That's okay, that's okay. Oh, and Actually, can I just interrupt and say everyone should really uh, mute their phone. There's a little button at the top right that says mute. Thank you, Wendy. Is everybody all right now? Yeah, so, um, so I'll talk a little bit about 
I mean, I feel like my whole life has been at the core a spiritual one. And it started here on Kauai. I, I grew up on Kauai in the 50s and 60s in Lihue, in this house that you see me right now, um, running in the valley uh, between my house and Kauai High School, uh, right above Nawili Wili, which was our beach with no hotel on it, or as my dad called, no chicken coops up on the ridge, but it was just all beach. And um, I was the oldest of five children. My parents met in social work school at the University of Hawaii after World War II, where my dad served in the military intelligence system um, service. Uh, and he, he died three years ago, but he, um, you know, he really experienced um, the racism that occurred during the war. It, and that's why I became such a passionate advocate for justice. Um, so my mom and dad met in Honolulu, married, and then came home to my dad's home in Kauai. My grandparents came as immigrants from Japan, from Hiroshima and Yanai City. And um, my grandfather became a cook for the uh, a rice, Sheriff Rice here in Lihue. And my grandmother was a Japanese school teacher um, in the building that Kawamura's now uses. That was the Japanese school. And, and um, I don't know that much about, my, my grandparents were strong Christians and they helped to start Lihue Christian Church, which is right across from Hamura's Simon. And I don't know, I wish, my grandfather died when I was two years old. So I don't know that much about him, but my grandmother lived till she was 103. And so I had many experiences and memories and stories that she told me. And she said that in her broken English, because she didn't speak much Japanese um, English, um, that when she was a little girl growing up in Japan in the late 1800s, um, she, uh, her dad sent her to a Christian school where she learned to sing, Jesus Loves Me, and, in English. And he told her, they were Buddhists, his dad, her dad was a Buddhist. He told her, the world is changing and you have to learn about the outside world. And I um, wish I knew my great grandfather, but anyway. Um, so she, they both came over and my grandfather, after a while and with the help of the Rice family, who was extremely generous and actually Amfac had held up all the land, controlled it, Amfac being the big corporation that owned Lihui Plantation but the Rice family, which owned a lot of land, were the ones that actually sold land to Japanese merchants. And that's why Lihui Christian Church, they donated that land um, and barbecue in and uh, even Rice Shopping Center, right? Those, um, they really helped the, the Japanese Americans who were coming up um, in their own entrepreneurism and businesses and so forth. So my grandfather started a general merchandise store right across from Lihui Plantation, uh, sorry, Lihui Mill, you know, where you go down Haleko Road, right there. And then he eventually moved to Kuhio Highway where um, across from Kentucky Fried Chicken and where Two Frogs Hugging used to be, but um, right in that intersection around there. And that was Lihui, um, no, that was Yukimura's, the home of everyday low prices. And I grew up, you know, after school, going to the back of the store when my grandmother was um, taking the bulk produce and putting them into little packages, string beans and mung beans, and would help her there. But it was a family operation. My father was the second son. My, my um, uncle, Yosho, was the real dynamic um, uh, manager and proprietor of Yukimura's. Um, and so I grew up 
with God as a fact. I mean, it wasn't about a belief. It was, you know, he existed. We said prayers every day and every, um, when we went to bed, we went to church every Sunday. And um, I have memories of my Sunday school classes. It was in my Sunday school class with Mrs. Yamahira, where she was stressing how you have to believe, <laughs> I suddenly started thinking, what? This is a belief. It's not a fact. And um, that started my questioning. And, and then I, middle, in middle school, we had these most amazing um, pilgrim fellowship summer camps in Koke'e at the CCC camp or at Camp Slaget mainly at the CCC camp. And that's when all the um, congregational churches, which was the missionary church, and they're all around the island, Kapa um, United Church and Lihue Union Church and Waimea. Anyway, all the kids around the island ended up at summer camp for a week or two in Koke. And I have some of my favorite childhood memories from that camp. And it was in middle school at that camp um, where we started saying prayers as a group, and I was so self-conscious, but I could feel the presence of God. And at the same time, I was having all these doubts. So I went through this period of questioning. Um, but one day in the church library, I found this book called In His Steps. And it was this kind of, um, gosh, revivalism kind of book. Uh, and it was a story about this minister who was preaching one Sunday. And then this homeless person came in, stopped the whole um, church service and walked to the front of church and said, you minister are a hypocrite. You talk about love and all of this. And this week I came to your house and you turned me away. And I think he collapsed. And that shook the minister so much that at the next service, he he, he made a call to his congregation and he said, I, um, I want to ask any of you who want to join me in this um, study, I guess, after church every Sunday, and we're going to talk about walking in Jesus' steps. And um, in everything we do, asking, what would Jesus do? And I was like, I was so fascinated by the story and it told about this beautiful opera singer who gives up her career to sing in the slums of Chicago or someplace and um, work uh, to in, in that environment and a businessman who had these really tough decisions and the decisions they made, um, but everyone, you know, trying to live in his steps. And I was like, I, I was just so amazed at that story. Um, so, you know, I went to college and um, I, I had an epiphany in the second week of being at Stanford. I, I thought I was, I, when I left um, Kauai, I thought I was never going to come back uh, to live. I was going to join the Peace Corps. It was the time of Jack Kennedy and all of that. Ask not what you country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And I was, you know, foreign service and all these thoughts about serving in some faraway country. Um, but I would, but I was also listening to lectures uh, um, from Paul Ehrlich talking about the population explosion and hu human biology was in an experimental course at Stanford. And the first Earth Earth Day was at Stanford um, in 1970. I was a junior then. And, and so, and then I would come home for the summers and I would see what was happening in Honolulu where raw sewage was pouring out at Sand Island. And they, the joke was that the state bird was the construction crane because everywhere you looked in Honolulu, there were cr um, cranes building high rises. And um, I would come home, I do remember sitting on the beach at Poli Holly and thinking, I don't want this to happen to Kauai. I, I all of a sudden started appreciating Kauai. I, my friends used to, and I used to joke about it being the rock where nothing happened. And um, 
I was so homesick at Stanford. I, I could hardly stand it. So, and, and it was just, it was not just the beauty and the beach and the mountains, but it was also the community, the cultural diversity, the, um, you know, where rank and status wasn't that important. And, um, you know, the, the races, although there were, there were issues, my, my Japanese girlfriends couldn't date Filipino boys when I was going up to high, growing up in high school. So it wasn't a perfect society, but um, in my generation, it was much as it is in succeeding generations, you know, much more um, colorblind, if you will. So, um, so then, and then I came home in 1970 and worked at Hanamalu restaurant as a waitress, but then Tony Hodges was running for the US Senate. He had started Life of the Land and created, um, he made ecology a household word in, in uh, Hawaii. He was filing lawsuits to stop uh, these open dumps and oil pollution and so forth. And so then I decided to go to law school, even though Tony told me that by the time I got out of law school, the world would be destroyed. Um, I was this good Japanese girl who was going to get my degree before I started <laughs> doing anything. Um, so I went to law school and then, um, and I was really clear I was going to come home and save the environment. That was my, you know, mission. And so I came home and I, in 1975 and I worked for legal aid um, doing divorces by night a day, and community organizing by night, because there was this huge land development in 1959, right? Hawaii became a state, and that started this huge development push. We got on the map in terms of other people on, in the country, and tourism was starting, and everybody wanted to develop. So in 1974, there was a proposal to develop condos in New Malu, and a floating restaurant. And there was a proposal to build a thousand hotel rooms and condominiums and golf course beyond where the Hyatt is in, at Mahaulapu. And there was a proposal for a convention, a center in Kilauea with a golf course. And I came home with citizens already organizing uh, to stop the development. And there was a proposal to tear down the Waiohai cottages in Poipu and um, build an eight-story hotel, which was going to break through the, uh, the um, four-story height limit. And because variances was grant, were granted to give the same privilege that another property have that was gonna snowball into higher and higher buildings. So we had our hands full and, um, and we had all of these battles. Uh, and you know what? Oh, I mean, actually, you could make a movie out of those years because there was a lawsuit against the developers of Mahaulapu. Grow Farm had given them the development rights. And, um, but I think a couple weeks before, a couple months before the mayoral election and a couple weeks before the Land Use Commission hearings, um, Jean Holmes, the editor of the Garden Island, printed a verbatim inter-office memos between the developer of Mahalupu and the mayor and the Land Use Commission chair, um, showing that they had had meetings and that these um, officials had made commitments to okay the development before the public hearing. Um, and that there were things like the, uh, I think it was the mayor recommended the developer hire a certain attorney to represent them and specified a fee which they would pay to the attorney. I mean, this was all verbatim in the Garden Island and the blank, blank, blank hit the fan and, um, and Jean Holmes was sued as well as my mother and the Ohana O Mahaulapu. My mom's name was on the minutes of the, she was just one of the attendees. Um, but they were all sued. Nobody knew who stole the papers. 
Um, I only found that out about 20 years after the incident. But we had our own um, um, Pentagon papers <laughs> because uh, they sued to enjoin further publication and uh, they hauled us all into court. And we had this fiery young attorney, Courtney Carr and Donald Kagawa, who became homeless and recently died. But anyway, um, the, uh, the lower court held for the developers and the Garden Island um, publisher, publishing company, um, who didn't necessarily agree with their editor, Gene Holmes, decided not to appeal. So that's where it ended, but the damage had been done. And the mayor lost the election by 200 votes. And um, it got so embarrassing for the Land Use Commission that they turned down the development. So, and I can tell you a story for the new Malo condos where we actually join hands against a bulldozer and um, Kilauea where Max Graham representing the Kilauea ag farmers um, stopped the Land Use Commission, well, they actually convinced the Land Use Commission to vote against that. Um, so, you know, the history of Kauai and the reason why we're still Kauai today is really due to these people. And one day somebody will write a book and maybe one day I'll write a story of my life. But um, so I was involved in that. And that's why 1976, I decided to run for office because um, because I wanted to be where the decisions were being made. And um, there were six one votes all the time, but I found out there was a power in being on the council and just speaking the alternatives and asking the questions. And pretty soon it was five two votes when Rodney Adal from Kilauea got elected. And then it was uh, four three when Kaipoa Singh got elected. Um, but by then I was running for mayor because I found out that you could pass a resolution and the mayor could ignore it. You could pass a law and the mayor could ignore it. Um, and that a lot of the uh, change happened in the executive decision making and uh, project implementation. So like recycling projects and so forth, the council can fund it, but they can't really design or implement it. Or even like the Adolescent Drug Treatment Center, which was a fiasco. So um, more recently, um, so that's when I ran. And at every step that I ran, I had this, this soul searching I had to do because in 1976, when I ran, first ran for council, it was like, you can't do this. This is like too much. I can't speak. I can't, um, you know, and, and Tony Kunimura, who was already in office, I mean, you know, when I ran against him for mayor in 1980, he went, she, she can't, what's going to happen if there's a, a hurricane or, a, you know, and she's going to be the mayor. Um, so <laughs> there were a lot of those issues. Um, and I would do these self-help courses <laughs> in 1976, which I count as my, my search. Um, I did the S training and the difference between and and but is what freed me up to run for council because I was saying I want to run for the council, but I'm really not good enough. I don't know how to do this. And I learned that instead of saying but, which kind of negates what I want to do, if I said I want to run for council and I, I'm not good enough, you could have both and it won't stop, you know, feel, not feeling good enough, it won't stop you. You can just go run for council anyway, which is what I did. And then when I ran for mayor, I ran for mayor in 1980 and I lost by 800 votes because the surfers didn't go and vote. Um, Chinatown was saying that, you know, that's where you really find out who's going to win the better, the, the, um, uh, those who are placing bets at Chinatown, <laughs> they said I was going to win, but then the mayor's office was bombed the incumbent mayor whom I was running against, um, Mayor Malapit, and I was blamed for it because Nukoli'i uh, was, uh, what happened in Nukoli'i? Anyway, that's another story in and of itself. 
Um, but uh, so I lost, and then I ran in 1982, and I lost again, and then I, um, I guess it was really great that I lost because in 1984, I had my daughter, <laughs> and um, and then I ran in 1984 for council, 86, and then finally in 88, I ran again for mayor, and same thing. How can I do this? Um, because I was playing the video of the two losses and before in 80 and 82. And the hardest thing about losing is your supporters, their disappointment, but also their risk because of a lot of them risk their careers. Uh, you know, county workers, if they supported me openly, they would not get promoted or they would be ostracized. Um, and and they they still supported me and i you know i knew they were in jeopardy when i lost um but also i i always have my self doubts you know and so i went to my friend's house to videotape my announcement the night before i was scheduled to announce that i was running for mayor and when he played it back i told him terry i wouldn't even vote for her you know <laughs> and so I went home and I tried to all night. I tried to compose this <laughs> this um, speech that I wasn't going to run, and I couldn't do it either. So I I looked haggard and went at my press conference and I just I just was in rote, right? I just read the speech that I was going to run, and um, but then um, people started stepping up, and that's a whole history in itself. But um, but I won uh, by a two to one vote. And, and then I became mayor and I had to um, appoint a cabinet when I had never really ever had executive <laughs> help before. And, um, you know, so it was step by step. And then, so that was 88. And um, one year later, I, my, the, um, my finance director in, overseeing the audit, the finan annual financial audit, um, found that $1.3 million had been embezzled um, by the county treasurer. And, um, you know, the, the Hanalei boating situation was exploding with like 30 commercial boats going out of Hanalei and telling the kids swimming in the river to get out of the way. And, um, you know, so, it, and then, in 1992, the hurricane came. So a lot of my dreams about, you know, what I was going to do as mayor was kind of like turned into a lot of crisis management. However, what I learned was how to leverage a crisis and get what I wanted done anyway. So for the Kauai bus, we had started one line between Kapa and Han, um, Lihui as a public transportation system. Okay, can you close that door? And, um, and then when the hurricane hit and we didn't have any kind of communications like we did today, the repeater station was down. We were mainly communicating by, um, um, what are those, ham operators and um, sending messages to Kong Radio and the water department by bicycle. Um, we, um, but we got a hotline to the White House because Hurricane Andrew had happened one month before and George Bush Sr., who was president, was getting a lot of bad PR and Clinton was running against him and it was September and the election was in November. So he didn't want any more bad publicity from Kauai. So we had a hotline to the White House and my transportation manager and I, sitting in my office one day said, okay, let's use that hotline. So we called at the White House and I don't think I made the call. Somebody else made it for me. We need a bus system for Kauai because the people's cars had been smashed by falling trees. Their tires had been flattened by glass or nails. And we got these messages. We need public transportation. So um, in two days, the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, was in my office, and we hired the tour bus co 
company buses to run the main line, the Belt Highway. And the FTA ordered us buses, even with bike racks, because we had a plan already. So we knew we wanted bike racks. They, they ordered them for the feeder routes from Eli Eli Heights or Wailua Homesteads to the main line. And um, we had an island wide bus system that ran from Koke to the end of the road. And because it was FEMA funded, we couldn't charge. So it was like a free but public transportation bus system. And, um, and there were stories of Kupuna going from Kekaha to Hanalei to visit their friends. And, um, and people could get around. They could go to the DACs, the disaster assistance centers, and, and get their insurance companies and get their business done. Um, so, and then we had started pilot recycling and composting projects. And we had to leverage it into mountains of green waste, mountains of white goods, mountains of co um, uh, wood, so that we could burn them in Gay and Robinson's burner, so that the, all of the mountains of trash wouldn't go into our landfill and use up all its life. Um, so, you know, that's what we learned. Anyway, um, so. I guess I should close. I, I just want to say that my mother was, a, um, she came from a strong Buddhist household. And uh, when she got married, she wasn't even sure that her father was going to, she got married in a Christian, Makiki Christian church, because my dad's family was such strong Christians. And of course, the wife always took the faith of the husband, right? So um, she walked, she wasn't sure whether my uh, her, my grandfather, her dad, was going to walk her down the aisle, and she had her uncle ready to do that. But my, I think my grandmother, who was a remarkable lady, um, must have talked to my grandfather, and he came, he showed up, and he walked her down, and she became a very very strong Christian. But my two brothers became as I grew up, because my parents gave us so much freedom in um, and seeking information and searching our own path, um, my two brothers became strong Buddhists. In fact, my brother John got his master's in Buddhism at the Naropa Institute, which was a brand new and maybe the first Buddhist university in the country. And my brother Miles um, studied at the um, here in Honolulu with Roshi Aiken, Aiken or something like that. Anyway, um, and, and my teachers, you know, include Thich Nhat Khan and, um, and the Dalai Lama. So, um, you know, I don't see any division. And that's why the interfaith round table so appeals to me, um, because as we all know, um, there's no separation. We just have different paths to the same place. And um, yeah, maybe I'll stop there and we can have a conversation. You guys can share and ask questions. Thank you, Joanne. I guess everybody should unmute. You want to take part in the conversation? I, I have a question, Joanne. And I, mm -hmm. Sure, you probably thought about this, and you probably talked to us in the in the past about it, if not formally at a meeting, maybe individually. How, how do you how do you see what? Or let me put it this: What role do you see for the interfaith roundtable in helping Kauai? I know that's a pretty broad thing, but that's you know what we like besides bringing the religions together be able to cooperate and understand each other, what, what do we do? I know you're familiar with some of our activities, but there's something else you might have in mind, or even if it's, if it's very general, you know, what, what would you see our organization helping Kauai in some way? Wow, that's a really good question. just reach out to the different religions, especially 
the more conservative Christians, um, because I I think um, we have to find bridges and ways to um, a newsletter um, because. Joanne, you're breaking up a little day bit. Out at Wanyihau, uh, Samara. Oh, okay, maybe I gotta move. Um, I see that my connection. They said is unstable. All right, it, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I, I can hear you. Okay, tell me, give me that feedback if it happens anymore, and I'll try to move. But. Um, I volunteered with Samaritan's Purse. Are, are you familiar with the group? It, it's a Billy Graham started group, but they're uh, of volunteers that goes wherever there's a disaster. And they have brought a medical van to New York City to help with the COVID. Um, so they're very professional, highly trained people, and a very high performance team that goes out and helps regardless of um, religious background. So they, in their newsletter, they talked about how they helped LBTG um, T people and um, uh, anybody, you know, of all religions and, and faiths. And um, so that's how I got on their newsletter. And I've really, you know, one of the seven habits of highly infected people is seek to understand before you seek to be understood. And I just try to understand. So I've gone to the big rallies here at, um, at Medina Stadium because I have friends in that group and I just want to keep in touch and I want to understand. Um, and, and I want to keep the dialogue going. And one day I met one of the ladies in my uh, doctor's office. And we started sharing about something. It, it was about either our ch children or about our marital relationships. It was something pretty personal, but we made such a connection just talking about that. And I feel like we have to bridge this sign holding where one you know, one group's holding sign on saying one thing and the other group is shouting the other thing from across the street and, and relate to each other as parents, as, um, you know, grocery shoppers. <laughs> I mean, just the human, uh, seeking hu human connections over the ordinary channels of life or something. Uh, and and then begin to talk about the hard subjects. But um, I'm reading a, I'm reading a, um, it's called The Team of Rivals. It's the story of Abraham Lincoln and how he brought together a cabinet of his presidential rival, rivals to be on his cabinet and the whole history of the war. And I'm like, I mean, it really was brother fighting brother. And it talks about General Lee, who was a West Point grantee, and they offered him the head of the Union Army. And he went home and he said, I can't fight against my own Virginia. And so, you know, the, there's these really principled people on both sides of the war killing each other. It's like, how can that happen? Uh, it's such deep agony and, and suffering. And um, I'm just thinking, how do we, how do we live love in a way that can make these connections somehow? But Joanne, I, I want to make sure I understood your, your points because she, there was that interference. I think the first thing you said was to, you advised us to reach out to especially the more conservative uh, Christian elements. That, I think that was your first point. Then you mentioned this organization, Samaritans something. Samaritan's Purse. Purse. It's a, it's a disaster assistance group uh, that formed, uh, was formed by B. Graham or, or his followers. And, and they've developed a real disaster. I, I actually had the experience of that from Southern Baptists when they brought in their disaster crew and they 
They fed the people of Kauai for two months um, because they, they, it was a disaster ministry is what they did. Oh, I'm seeing that my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me? I, I can okay. hear you clearly. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was just talking about how I made connection to this group. I didn't know who Samaritan's Purse was when I volunteered. But after I signed up and gave them my email, I started getting all these emails. And I even got a book about the life of Will Graham. I think it's um, Billy Graham's son, who's now leading the movement. Anyway, I'm, you know, if they know how to do outreach. But I didn't throw it in garbage. Um, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> but um, I, I just... I just um, feel like it's so important to really understand them and not um, stereotype them in a way that says, oh, I know who you are, um, you know, and I don't disagree, I, and I disagree with you. I know who you are, and I disagree with you. Yeah, we, we actually uh, have our own history already on this island <laughs> of yeah. trying to reach out and uh, have been somewhat successful. We, we, uh, uh, you know, the, I think you've probably heard of the, the National Day of Prayer every, uh, I think it's every May, and the two, the two it's separate final. ceremonies at City Hall, and you, finally Mayor Kawakami said, no, we're not going to allow that, and so it, <laughs> uh, it, it was, it was, it was, I guess we didn't have it anyway because of the coronavirus, but, uh, or am I thinking of last year? But at any rate, we did, we did make a couple of friends among uh, a conservative uh, fundamentalist Christian pastors, uh, but they apparently got a lot of flack from the, uh, the others on the island. So, but at least uh, I think we, hopefully we're known as people who are trying to reach out to them uh, and have had some limited success working on that National Day of Prayer together. One, one, uh, one year we were actually forced to do it that way in a sense because we couldn't, I can't remember why we, oh, it was raining, so we couldn't use the rotunda area. So we all had to go un into this space uh, in, an, in a nearby building in the hallway that's covered and as it turned out, they, they arrived early because usually their service is after hours. And we ended up using their sound system and collaborating and actually having friendly relations with the, with the head person over there. Uh, so uh, that, that rain we, we must tried have to make us, pardon? God. What's that? The rain must have been, the rain must have been the hand of God. Yes. <laughs> Yes. However, we would say that in Buddhism. Yes, <laughs> it 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 worked. And and Hari, our our current uh, co-chair, has personally made calls to different Christian churches to try to uh, create some kind of communication, invite them to, I think, come to the interfaith, and uh, has gotten, I guess, quite a few rejections. But I can let Hari do that. But yeah, uh, we've, I, we've called go ahead, every Hari. We've called every single group twice, and we've sent letters twice to all the groups. And many of them uh, have told me right out on the phone, they said, if, if it's not Christian, we're not going. Yes, and when, I, when I was mayor, I had an interfaith service the second time I was elected. So when I was reelected, I held it in the, um, in the uh, convention hall. Um, and I had a Buddhist and a Jewish and Hawaiian minister and anyway and um, the Christian right boycotted it because I had a born-again nanny at that time and and she said that um, she was told that they were pagans in that ceremony so they couldn't come but you know um, we have I think 10 minutes left and so I just want to see if anybody else has any questions but I um, I just want to say, I, I think we, rather than wearing our hat and inviting them in, 
I would go to their events and just be with them on their terms for a while, mm -hmm. just, just to see and, and, and just, you know, it's kind of a, a way of respect doing it on their terms first. And, and then I think that might help. But anyway, maybe we should hear if other people have other issues. I have a question for you, Joanne. Sure. <clears throat> you know, as, as things, as life has changed over the last six months, and our economy has gone from a visitor-based economy to a at-home economy, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. do, you think, do, you think, uh, do you think Kauai is particular, particularly can adapt well to a non-visitor-based economy um, over time? And if so, what, what, what's our export? What, you know, do we have a, a niche that you okay. think we haven't really tapped into yet? Okay. Well, I wouldn't say that our goal is a non-tourism economy. I would say that it's a diversified economy where tour tourism isn't the dominant economic base. Because I think there is a room for tour there's room for tourism. And um, early on, I was exploring the idea of tourism as a pilgrimage, uh, you know? And um, I shared with Wendy my vision statement um, because I could see Kauai becoming a model of a place that has learned to live harmoniously, um, to get over our political, our religious, our other divisions and learn how to do that. And where people would come to learn and share and uh, celebrate. And that's tourism, you know? Um, so we, that's one thing to explore how to people to people tourism. I mean, it can be some of the most enriching, enlightening experiences. But we have to, in the COVID world, we have to learn how to do it safely. And I just submitted with a group of the group I'm working with, we're, we call ourselves the Kauai COVID Discussion Group. And it, you know, it includes doctors Evslin and Wiener and Isaki and um, Schwartz. And we've proposed a plan to the governor as to how to bring people in safely. And if Wendy will give me all your emails, I, I can send that to you or make you part of my list anyway. Because if we can figure out how to do it safely, it's going to be at a much lower level. I mean, right? We got 5,000 incoming travelers, both returning visitors and returning residents and visitors, 5,000 a day prior to COVID. Um, and right now we're looking at a thousand, this is Kauai, a thousand a day go up to that level. But if we do the only one test that the governor is suggesting, um, we're going to be allowing 100 people infected with COVID a month into Kauai undetected. And you know this recent outbreak, it's, um, nobody can tell me it's not travel related because how can after 10 weeks, yeah. you know, we get eruption of the virus without it being travel related. What it shows is that our system of tracking is highly um, inadequate. So you want to stop them at our boundaries. That's how we stopped it in the first place. We just, you know, said don't come. And we imposed the 14 day quarantine, which discouraged most people from coming, except the risk takers who don't care about other people. Um, and we, ha we aren't, haven't even been able to track them carefully. So what are we going to do when a thousand people start coming in every day? That's 7,000 7, people a week. So, um, so we have to do that. But going to your question, um, I, uh, one of the people on, my, on our team is a virologist that is working and on his biomed um, group is working on tests, but they're not ready yet. And um, we went to the community college and we said, because we were dealing with this issue of not having enough test kits, not having enough processing capacity for testing, which is key to prevention and detection. And we said, what if we turn KCC's lab into a laboratory that could produce test kits and produce um, and process um, things? Because that was Korea's, South Korea's secret. 
after the SARS-1, 10 years ago, they realized, wow, we were unprepared. So they've been beefing up their capacity. And one of their secrets is local lab capacity. So I'm going, so that could be a new industry, you know, because we're, if we're going to be ready for recurring pandemics or epidemics, or just protecting the health of our people, um, it's a high tech business and we could, you know, learn how to protest, protect, um, pr produce test kits. And then we should be, it, it really is going to come down to how we're using the funding we have. Like after Hurricane Iniki, we hired realtors who are out of work to help us um, uh, help our elderly navigate the rebuilding and insurance um, uh, process so they could get their help homes rebuilt and there were scammers right and left and so we needed really sharp people uh, Roberta Charles from Poipu was one of them and she was assigned to our housing and elderly affairs office and she helped so many people so hire people in our, like our tour buses for hire a hotel to make them a quarantine hotel where we quarantine everybody in one place so you only have seven doors to watch instead of 30 hotels where you have to go and check on people. And, um, you know, so use our COVID money, monies right now to keep our businesses alive and, um, and leverage them into the new economy. And we should, every conservation project like a Mason Chalk at the uh, clearing of Hulea to turn it into a fish, a productive fish pond, we should be hiring people to do that work now so that so every money spent should be not only for giving fish but for teaching people to fish and and we should be putting that criteria on for um uh for any money spent the council and the legislature should be saying okay if we spend this 10 million dollars here um it, how is it going to diversify the economy create a more sustainable community, blah, 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 blah. And it's gonna take retraining and a lot of stuff. But that's kind of the mindset that I think we should begin to develop. Thank you. Good. Joanne, I would like to just say thank you for the continued efforts that you're making in um, broadening communication on the island and care for the population as a whole, uh, especially special interest groups of demographics that may not have as much representation as the business groups have. So th thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Well, thank you for all the work each of you do in your own way to make this community better because um, our community is special because of each person here in the group and others like you who are, you know, doing the work on a daily basis. Well, does that bring us to a close? Thank you very much, Joanne. All right. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you all. And um, so much. do you want to receive this report that we've done? Yes, yes please. Okay, yes. because it's going to be, I, I, we're trying to, it feels like they're kind of set on a plan and not open to information. And I'm, I'm hoping that as, as people learn the plan and keep speaking about it, um, Mel One Raposo time. spoke on it on his face time last night. I was so grateful for that. You know, he, he showed that if we do a second test, he, he showed the chart in our report. If we do a second test, we reduce um, the number of people for every 10,000 people coming in, instead of 32 um, undetected COVID cases, it goes down to five with a second test and, uh, and a six day quarantine. We've got the quarantine down from 14 days to 60 days if you use tests in combination. 
And, you know, so I think we're moving in the right direction, but right now to do one pre-boarding test and, and I worry about even the validity of those tests, but, you know, assuming they're val valid and then they just come in, uh, it's really likely to be a disaster for our people. Yes. So, okay. I, I do. Thank you so I much. I can't you, stay, Jen. but bless you all. Yeah. Okay. Bye. I'm going to be, I'm going to leave. Yeah. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye. Uh, Vijay, would you like to continue with? Uh, oh, excuse me for a minute. Uh, would yeah. somebody like to take over the duties of hosting? I have to leave now. <laughs>